another fine day and an hour to talk power. Not with me, with an expert, right? And that has been the whole thing that, about doing this power hour. This is show number six, which I'm pumped about. And it is about me learning more about strength and conditioning. How dare I go 20, 20 years in this business without really sitting down to, to talk to any certified coaches. Well, that is changing this fall. And guest number six is this man right here, William Fly, a USA Wrestling, USA Wrestling. See, I'm so, I got so much wrestling on the brain all the time. Um, USA Weightlifting Certified and preparing for a CSCS test. Uh, William Fly, out of Northwest Cabarrus High School in North Carolina. Coach, welcome to the Power Hour. What's going on? Awesome to be here. Well, we're excited to have you, man. And tell us, how long have you been coaching strength? Um, coaching strength specifically, probably about five years. Okay. But I've been involved in education and coaching since 2012. Okay. So I, that's where, yeah, 2012. So what made you want to go or pursue strength? Um, I knew growing up as a kid – um, but I, ever since I got into high school, I just knew that I wanted to be in the weight room somehow, some way. That um, I grew up in Virginia, in Southern Virginia, where we, you had weightlifting after school, but we didn't have weight training classes, kind of how it is now in a lot of states. Um, and I just knew that the weight room just transformed me into whatever it is I didn't, wherever I wanted to be. I knew the weight room being in there, I didn't get my butt kicked no more. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to be strong enough to handle myself up front, uh, playing offensive line in high school. And then just being in the weight room, you know, it allowed me to overcome some of my uh, physical attributes, you know, being vertically challenged. <laughs> and uh, it allowed me to play in college, it allowed me to play at the Division three level at Greensboro College. And then from there, you know, you're playing against some, you're playing against some, even Division three, some big old dudes. Oh, absolutely they are. The weight man. room kind of helped me again, overcome some of my, shortcomings, so to speak, and uh, make sure that I could at least uh, compete at the level I wanted to. And then I just knew that, hey, I want to do this for a job. And yeah. it wasn't until about maybe 2015 when I finally got my shot in the weight room. Uh, started off as an elementary school PE teacher. Okay. <laughs> so that was kind of my foot in. And then I would help at my first high school I coached at Richmond Senior High School in Rockingham just with the summer programs uh, and eventually got up to where we brought in the middle school kids. And then yeah. I ended up being in charge of the middle school kids and their development. And then that turned into my first strength job at a ninth grade Academy. So we had a school just for ninth graders. Okay. Okay. So essentially my job for all the athletes that came through was just to get them ready for the senior high. And so that's what really started. I just kind of never looked back. You know, you get, someone's going to pay me a paycheck to be in a weight room all day. <laughs> right. I know folks are fussing about paychecks, but, you know, I feel like I'm stealing some days. I'll tell you what, I've, uh, as I started pursuing this little show, I have found that, oh, my goodness, I think I'm really interested in this. So I've been engaged in all of them, all five. I've learned something. And this is number six. Tonight, your coach is going to be talking about exercise progressions and regressions, which I'm excited to hear about his four big lifts. And your four big lifts were? Yeah, we're going to uh, pretty much run down how we progress our kids through bench press, squat, deadlift, and uh, power clean, or some may call it clean from the floor. There's different terminology about how folks call that, but you know, for at least in my, my world, it's called power clean. Okay. And, okay, so you went to – you grew up in Virginia. Now yeah. you teach and coach in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And you're and how big is North uh, Northwest Cabarrus High School? Um, is to get can I kind of give you a comparison in terms of like classifications. In North Carolina, the highest is four A. So uh, I'm not sure what it is in your area, but I know Florida they go up to eight. Yeah. South Carolina they go up to six. So four is like the big dogs in terms of your big schools. Like my previous stop at Northwest at North Mecklenburg, we were four A. We were a pretty big school with almost two thousand kids. Um, Northwest Cabarrus is a 3A school, and so we're a tad small at the moment, smaller. Um, yeah. So maybe we might be around 1,500. 
that's still a good sized school. That's I mean, and we're, and we're and we're growing. I mean, that whole area of Concord is just popping up. We get a lot of folks that are leaving Charlotte and trying to uh, move into the Concord area. They just got done building one high school, and um, our school is right next to an Amazon f- fulfillment center. And everywhere you look, there's apartments here, apartments here, apartments here. And so I'm, it's not going to be too long until we're 4A as well. Okay. All right, man. Well, sounds like you're at a good size school. And uh, I don't want to take too much time. So I'll tell you what, we're going to go to commercial break. When we come back, Coach Fly, which is a great name, by the way. I appreciate it. You can thank yeah, my parents. That's, yeah. that's your real name? That's not just a Twitter name? No. There's, like I said, I'm, on the, I'm the only fly that I know of in North Carolina. <laughs> that's pretty great. Virginia and the Tidewater area, but yeah, definitely a unique name. Yeah, yeah I love it. Don't forget it. Well, when we come back from commercial break, Coach Fly is going to take it away, coach us up. So let's hit the commercials. We'll be back in a moment. Hey, my name is Wade DeVries, head football coach at Roxana High School down near St. Louis in Illinois. Uh, the Chief Pigskin Online Clinic has been huge for us this year. The amount of content that's available on there is exceptional. And having been a speaker on it, the number of contacts that I've been able to make with coaches from around the country has been unbelievable. I couldn't recommend it more. Hey, welcome back to the Power Hour. Without further ado, it is time for me to turn this over to an expert, someone who knows what they're talking about and is ready to coach us up. So without further ado, William Flott of Northwest Cabarrus High School, North Carolina. So again, um, thank you for all of you that are here. This is a pretty awesome deal, uh, being able to share what we do at Northwest Cabarrus High School and to kind of simply just help other people. That's really all this is, just helping other people in terms of what they're doing, how they're going about doing it, by means is my way, and no means is the correct way. It is just a simple way. And that's the great thing about our profession. There's tons of ways of doing it. You know, I think Coach said I'm number six, and you're probably going to hear six different ways of doing things. And then probably from there, you're probably going to hear tons and tons more. So I know that, uh, at least from here on out, Coach has a big slate of coaches Big, big, big time coaches that are doing great things and they do things their own unique way. So we're just going to run down our progressions and regressions about how we teach our movements. Um, so we'll go ahead and roll on into what are, what are those big movements. Uh, at least in our program, we are going to stress our squat progressions, clean progressions, deadlift progressions, and bench press progressions. So we'll first start off with our squat progressions. Um, our progressions go as follow. We're going to start most all of our kids off with an air squat. Then we'll go into a goblet squat, then a no hands front squat, and then a front squat, and then we'll finish up with your traditional back squat. And so you'll see a video as we're going along about what an air squat looks like, and you'll see some cues on the side as we go throughout all these videos. So as we're doing our air squat, it's completely body weight. No weight is required. We want their feet shoulder width apart. We want to glue their shoes to the floor, arms out in front, and we want their chest up, eyes up ahead. We'll play it again so you can see it as I'm talking. We're going to lower ourselves until our cheeks, our butt cheeks, are at or just below the kneecaps. And we want to make sure our knees are trying to stay behind our toes. Now, if they kind of push forward a little bit, ain't no big deal. But at least from cueing our stuff, that's kind of where we would like it to be. Uh, We'll probably stay in our air squat or our block zero probably for a while for our freshmen, Uh, especially during this COVID time. Uh, North Carolina, uh, we don't even have access to our kids right now. We're doing doing this. We're doing virtual uh, until they say otherwise. And so whenever we come back, uh, our kids have not done done anything since March. And so we will probably restart all of our kids at air squat and work them up through these progressions, no matter how long they've been lifting, what kind of caliber athlete they are, and we'll just push them through these stages. After air squat, we will roll into a goblet squat. So we will actually hold a weight. Uh, In the video, you have a dumbbell in front of you, but you can simply use a, you can hug a plate, you can uh, hold a kettlebell, 
it's really up to you and what you have access to. But the, the, a lot of the cues still apply. We want the feet shoulder apart. We want to glue them shoes to the floor. We're going to hug, uh, have that dumbbell against our chest in line with our torso and have that chest up, eyes up, lower our cheeks until we are at or just below our kneecaps and then keeping the knees behind the toes. And we'll incorporate our goblet squat in our one by 20 program. And honestly, um, with all those dumbbells you'll see, a kid will not be able to progress to a front squat until they can progress through those entire dumbbells. And so we can actually keep kids at goblet squat for quite a long time. Uh, I'm not really gonna rush a kid into a front squat or a back squat if they're not ready for it. And that's what these progressions serve as. It's just a way of getting kids ready for the barbell and to make sure when it is time to put bar in the front right position or on their back that they are physically ready to do so. Now from a goblet squat, we'll kind of little step back a little bit just in terms of allowing kids to feel what a front squat is supposed to feel like. A lot of time they struggle knowing where to place that bar. Um, so this is a no hands front squat or some people call it a zombie squat or a mummy squat. But essentially we're doing a front squat with no hands. Uh, same cues, at least from the waist down, feet shoulder width apart, glue our shoes to the floor. We want our arms straight out in front. Um, now in this video, you'll see the gentleman using a PVC pipe. Uh, you can use sticks. I mean, I've seen people just take uh, the sticks off brooms and they're just squatting broomsticks. We would obviously progress from a PVC pipe into a barbell. Um, but we just want them to understand where that bar is supposed to rest as they're going through. It should rest on and across the clavicle. Chest up, eyes up, lower ourselves till our cheeks are just at or below our kneecaps. And then obviously knees behind our toes. From there, we'll roll on into our actual front squat. So he's making that good right position from the get go. You can feed her shoulder the part. We want the bar resting across our clavicles. Um, elbows are elevated, creating a rack or a shelf for the bar to rest on. And at least in how I, we call it, I call it having angry elbows. Um, in, in, doing it any of this time during COVID, there's been a lot of MMA on M, uh, ESPN. And so really trying to have kids relate to having that elbow up and violent. If our elbows are up, it's going to be tremendously easier for our kids to hold that position. If those elbows start to droop down, they're putting all that weight in their wrist. And it's just, it's just not a very comfortable position, obviously. That's when you have your kids start complaining about my wrist hurt and stuff like that. So by having our elbows up and having angry elbows, and it creates a shelf. I've also heard your elbows are lasers. We're trying to shoot lasers into the wall. Uh, our kids understand angry elbows pretty easily. And then all the same things you've seen, chest up, eyes up, things about our cheeks and our kneecaps. And we'll actually just keep it rolling. We'll see it from, uh oh, we'll see it from the side view. And then we'll obviously roll on in a few reps into the front. You will notice that if a lot of kids, if they, they may need a little weight for the front squat to get the weight where it, get the position where it needs to be. Sometimes it might be too light. There's not enough force coming down on there to force their elbows up. So we kind of, we may add a five or a 10, at least when we're progressing through that. So we'll progress through our front squat. Um, I really don't have any sort set of standards in terms of when, when do we go from front squat to back squat. It's really more of a technical proficiency thing. Uh, some coaches might have uh, ratios and standards, uh, but at least in our program, it is really more of a proficiency sort of thing. And obviously, here's the granddaddy of them all. What everybody wants to do is the back squat. Uh, we'll see the bar in full contact with the traps, a full fist on the bar, pulling the bar down into the body. Uh, we want to pull the bar down into the body so that way the bar doesn't go anywhere. Um, if they're just kind of, that bar's hanging out on their back a little bit, that's when it kind of, kind of slide down a little bit. And that's kind of where you run into problems. We get all the same things apply with our back squat. So those are all our progressions for our squat. Now we'll roll on into our deadlift progressions. 
And we kind of use four progressions, um, two of them with a dumbbell and then two of them with a barbell. So we'll first start off with a high block or in this situation, a high plate dumbbell deadlift. And so we're gonna start by straddling over the dumbbell like a sumo wrestler. And obviously that dumbbell is resting on a plate. Now, depending on the kid's flexibility in their hips and in their ankles, you can stack those, dumb, those uh, plates as high as you need to. Um, so you can stack 245s. Uh, some places you might have, you actually have blocks, like the, um, the small DC blocks you might do um, pulls off on the floor. We didn't have any blocks, we just used plates. And so we'll put them however high they need to be. Lower our body till our hands are just underneath the head of the dumbbell. Uh, our backside and butt goes back. We're gonna engage our stomach and our core. We're gonna stack our spine. And we're gonna drive our legs through the floor. So really trying to push that floor away with my shoes. And we wanna ensure that our hips and our knees are raising up, rising up at the same time uh, until we are standing vertical. So from doing it from blocks, we'll just simply just take the blocks away and do a dumbbell deadlift. All the same stuff, we're just having that dumbbell at a lower position, but they have to hinge a lot more. And just like our goblet squat, we'll progress with our dumbbell deadlift until either A, we reach some sort of technical failure or until we run out of dumbbells. Um, I, you know, at least, in, my situation, I have 100 pound dumbbells. And so if they're able to rip through that 100 pound dumbbell, that's kind of how I know they're ready for the barbell. And again, we just, we don't want to load dysfunction. We want to make sure those kids are ready for the movement. Uh, when we get to the barbell, we want to rush that piece uh, too fast. So once we get done with the dumbbells, we'll roll, in, roll on into a uh, barbell deadlift and we will start just like we did our dumbbell we will start it from the blocks, or we'll start it from a plate position. And so we, when we start at least, we want, we want to position ourselves behind the bar. We want our feet shoulder apart. We want our shins to contact the bar. We want to quote unquote, feel the steel on our shins. Our lower body, um, we want an over and under hand grip. So with our kids, we tell them the hand that they write with or the hand that they um, throw with, that hand's going to be over, and the hand they don't write with is going to be under. Uh, we want to stick our backside, our butt, go, we want that to go back. And just like our dumbbell, we want to engage our stomach and our core, stack our spine, drive our legs through the floor, and then our knees and hips will rise up at the same time until we were standing completely vertical. And we do want to control the descent of the movement. Uh, I don't really allow too many of my kids at the top just to, jump, to drop from the top. We want to train both the positive and the negative portion of the lift to make sure we're getting uh, full range of motion, full benefit. And then just like our dumbbells, we will just take the box away and we'll go into a deadlift from the floor. You know, all the same cues, all the same jazz. We're just doing it from the floor. And those are our deadlift progressions. And we'll progress through those things as we see it. It's like with the bench, there's no timetable for how long we'll stay in that. Uh, it really just depends on what the kid is doing, um, technically, proficiently. And really, I just put their progression in their hands. So, hey, you want to use the barbell? You got to show me A, B, and C. Um, if they refuse to show me those things, and they'll stay doing dumbbell deadlifts the entire semester, the entire year. Um, so that's kind of how we put a little bit of accountability to our program. Hey, if you want to do the quote unquote fun stuff, you got to do all these things to make sure you're ready for the fun stuff. So that's deadlift. That was pretty short. This is kind of where a lot of teaching happens in our clean progressions, at least in terms of how we teach things, because cleans are probably the easiest thing to mess up. Unfortunately, you've probably seen tons of videos, y'all, of jacked up cleans. Um, whether it's the coaches that are teaching them incorrectly or it's the kids freelancing and doing their own thing and they're trying to pull weight. Um, we, are, we are really going to take our time with our clean progressions. 
um, probably a little bit slower than what the kids like, um, but it is what it is. We want to make sure that they're moving effectively and efficiently before we roll on to our steps. So the first step is an RDL shrug. And so we're going to, with any of our, bar, our clean movements, we want our thumbs outside our thighs, a full fist on the bar, knuckles are pointed to the floor. With our knuckles pointed to the floor, that allows the bar to stay tight to the body, just like how you see her. And we're going to simply slide the bar to the top of the knee, getting in that ready position. We're going to push the hips back into athletic position. And then from there, we're going to slowly drive the feet through the floor while extending the hips. And at the top, we're going to sh shrug our shoulders saying, I don't know. That's something that our kids probably know how to say very well. Uh, whether you're in a virtual environment or a in-person environment, hey, someone said, what's your homework? I don't know. Hey, why'd you clean your room? I don't know. So that movement, unfortunately, is pretty um, common in our athletes. And that's done very slowly. And we'll do it on the whistle. We'll go beep. First whistle, top of the knee. Next whistle, beep. And we'll slowly come up and trace and we'll hold it. And then we'll come back down. From our RDL shrug, we'll speed it up a little bit and we'll go into a jump shrug. So it's just the same thing. We're just adding a lot of juice and a lot of energy behind it. Um, getting thumbs in the same spot, full fist in the bar, middle to the floor. And with this, we're gonna violently drive our feet through the floor while fully extending our hips. At the top saying, I don't know, with our shoulders. And cues that we use to get that explosion is I want you, your head to touch the lights, or I want you to show off your vert or show off your hops, or I want you to get as tall as you can, as fast as you can. And that's just, oh, too far. And that's just how we coach our jump shrug. We're not asking for like a 40 inch vert, but you can tell she is giving effort. She's getting full extension as fast as she can. From there, from our jump shrug, we'll actually go into our um, clean pull, we kind of go back a little bit, at least in our terms, our jump shrug is the first pull. So we're pulling that bar with our shoulders. The second pull is the actual quote unquote pull. So the clean pull is where we go into the second pull of our movement. Thumbs stay the same, fists stay the same, athletic position, all that kind of stuff. But as we are extending, from our, that jump shrug position, I want to flare my elbows out, not back, not forward, but flare them out. And we want to pull that bar somewhere between our chest and our belly. Now, just for me personally, I'm a short dude. So that's a real small space. If you're watching this and you're blessed with height, that's a long space. And so really having those two guide points, we just want to pull that bar somewhere between our chest and our belly button and at the same time, continuing to shrug. And that is our clean pull. And we'll honestly stay at clean pulls for quite a while. Uh, we really won't get into catching the bar maybe for about a whole, uh, at least North Carolina, we do nine weeks. I'm not sure where it is where you are, but we might not even catch the bar for an entire nine weeks until we have shown proficiency in that. And then part of our progression, as we're doing that, we're progressing our kids through our squat stuff, through our squat patterns. So really, we won't allow a kid to catch the bar until they have demonstrated proficiency in the no-hands front squat. Yeah, we've already went over that in terms of our squat progressions, but this teaches them how to catch the bar, where it's supposed to be caught, and how it feels. Um, at least in my experience, a lot of kids can jump shrug tons of weight, they can pull tons of weight, but it's always from this position into the catch where things get hairy, where things get kind of screwy. And so we want to make sure they build confidence in that catch position so that way they can actually get under the bar and catch it. And we'll have, again, we won't allow them to catch anything until they can front squat proficiently. So if their front squat is jacked up, there's no way I'm going to ask them to catch the bar. But essentially, they got to catch it in some form of a front squat, whether it, they're getting full depth like this gentleman here, or they're doing a half front squat, or they're catching it 
at some level of depth. But once we have actually progressed them through the no hands front squat and the front squat, this is where we'll actually go into the catch. And so all our hand position stays the same. Uh, as we are catching the bar and we are driving our elbows through, that's where our, the angry elbows quote comes in, or you might use laser elbows or whatever you use. We drive our elbows, we lower ourselves under the bar, drive our elbows through to create that front right position. And then in terms of our feet, we're going to transition our feet from our jump pull position that we've been doing all of our RDL shrugs, jump shrugs, into our squat position. Now, I want you all to understand that this really isn't a dramatic shift. Unfortunately, I'm sure all of us have seen that starfish catch where those feet shoot out real wide and then they're all torqued up trying to catch it. We just want to simply move the feet, if y'all can see my hands, hopefully, from the jump position to the squat position. It's really not that big of a difference. But we have to transition our feet in that fashion to prepare our body to receive the bar. And then from there, we'll honestly work our hand clean from multiple levels. We'll work our hand clean from the hip level. We'll work it from mid thigh, top of the knee, below the knee, from the shin. And then eventually we'll do what everybody wants to do. We'll actually start from the, we'll finish from the floor. But again, there's not many kids that get to do it from the floor in our program. Uh, she was just, again, I, I bet any of you know, girls are tremendously easier to work with. Um, they listen and they're not hard headed, unlike some of our boys that we coach on a daily basis. Um, so that's why I picked my girls for my clean movements. They listen and do everything I asked them to do. We did have the one video of the gentleman um, doing the hand clean. So those are all of our clean progressions. So now we're kind of going into what every, at least every boy in America wants to do. Every boy in America wants to bench press. And that's, you know, when college XYZ shows up, that's probably one of the questions that they're going to ask. Um, I'm not sure how bench press relates to athletic ability. So if you're depending on your bench press, that means you're on your back. But bench press is a main way we develop upper body strength. And we'll progress those things through six phases. The first thing that we'll do is a hand release push-up. We can go into regular old push-ups. And then a one-arm dumbbell bench, alternating dumbbell bench, and just a regular dumbbell bench. And we will finish with the barbell. So in terms of a hand release push-up, I'm going to lay flat on the ground, hands off the floor. And essentially, I want to break the floor with my hands. We do a lot of this with our bigger athletes or maybe our athletes that are brand new to the weight room, and they just can't do uh, push-ups. By doing this, it allows them to do the reps and allows them to build confidence while building that upper body strength by being able to fire at a certain point and fire on command. So you'll see we want to start from the stomach, hands just on the shoulders. Um, at the end of it, keep our back and legs straight, ending up like a pencil. And we do our hand release push-ups as a part of our warm-up every day, no matter where they are in our progressions. From there, we'll obviously go into regular old push-ups. Obviously, we're not hands are coming off the floor. We're just rolling on doing push-ups. And then from there, we'll go into our dumbbell work. We'll start with a one-arm dumbbell bench press. We, we, we use one arm for the fact that we want to make sure that there's symmetry on both sides. That both sides are equal, the left side is equally as strong as the other. So with any of our bench movements where we're laying flat on the bench, we want our feet to be flat on the floor, have points of contact, shoulder blades on the bench, butt cheeks on the bench, we want our elbows tucked tight to our ribs, and we're going to drive that single arm vertically, punching through the dumbbell until straight, and we'll lower that back down. And then as we switch, he's not switching in the air. He's switching on his stomach where it's not going to fall on, put him in a situation that's going to be bad. So then you'll watch him 
transition uh, from the left to the right, or excuse me, left uh, right to the left, and driving that dumbbell vertical. So once you progress from a one-arm dumbbell bench, we'll go into an alternating dumbbell bench. So at the same time, one arm is doing work, the other is staying contracted, staying still, and um, learning how to stabilize and mobilize while the other arm is doing work. The same thing about our feet, feet on the floor, shoulder blades and butt in contact with the bench, and we'll alternate every rep. The elbow, and keep the elbow against the ribs until it is pressed. And it is very good for shoulder stability, knowing the, uh, allowing kids to keep tight so that way they're not wiggling across the bench. And then we'll go into our dumbbell bench. And in same cues, we're just doing both at the same time. And he's not going really fast. All of us will be slow and controlled, driving the dumbbells up and down. And then finally, whatever every young man in the world wants to do when they go to Planet Fitness with the YMCA is to bench press. Um, same cues with their feet. Feet are flat on the floor, butt on the bench, shoulder blades down. Um, a couple of things that we stress in terms of our bench press movement, um, an overhand grip on the bars, thumbs be, begin going around the bar. We don't want to have a suicide grip and end up being a YouTube video about how the bar jumps out of your hands and slams on your chest. We have to have our hands around the bar. It doesn't matter if it's a 10, 135, 225, 315, it doesn't matter. We want our whole hand on the bar. And from the beginning of it, we're going to have our, our bencher at least press the bar vertical till it's off the J-hooks. And obviously, we'll have a spotter assisting him as well. And we'll actually spend quite a bit of time coaching them how to be spotters. So you'll notice that the spotter will guide the bar off the J-hooks and over the individual's chest. Uh, in terms of the person actually doing the movement, they'll lower the bar to their, to their chest while keeping their elbows tight, press the bar vertically off the chest, and keeping the feet in contact with the floor and the body on the bench. And then since this was recorded, we've actually switched to a pause bench press, actually, to where a lot of you might have the issue of your classes, teams, they want to pretend their chest is a trampoline, they're sitting there getting after it, and they complain to coach, my chest hurts. My chest would hurt too. I just turned my chest into a trampoline, bouncing 225 off my chest. My, it would hurt too. And so we'll actually pause all of our stuff. And the kids don't like it because they can't lift as much weight. But that way it's tremendously safer in terms of doing the bench press. And you're still getting the effects of doing it and why we do it on a daily basis. Um, those are our four core movements. Um, I try to keep it kind of short and concise, give you the, the do's and the don'ts about what we do. Um, if you want to know anything else about what we do in terms of how we teach those movements, or you just have any questions at all um, about strength and conditioning in the high school, or you just have any questions about how, to, if, you're, if you're like me and you're virtual, what in the world do we do weightlifting virtually? I mean, how do I even navigate this? And especially with uh, coaches that might be up there in their tenure, what is this thing called Canvas? What is this thing called Google Classroom? How do I use that thing? Um, I'll be more than happy to help. And so you see my name, my email. Um, you'll see my Twitter. Actually, that, that, those uh, taglines go for both my Twitter and my Instagram. So you'll be more than happy to reach out on my personal or our strength program one. And like I said, I don't have any secrets. You can call me on my phone. I really don't care. Um, I will try my best to get back to answer you. To answer you. I'm not going to lie. You call for nine o'clock, I'm probably going to be asleep. Um, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can, as fast as I can. And uh, anything I can do to help you or anybody that's watching this, I'm all for it.
Wow. Coach, I enjoyed the heck out of that. We're going to go take a commercial break. And when you come back, that whole bottom half, all these questions, I love these progressions. So we'll be right back, commercial break in one second. What's up, coaches? It's Coach Blair. I've been shooting clinics uh, for Chief Pigskin since January. I uh, met some great coaches, learned a lot of stuff. Uh, I thank you guys so much for our community, and I hope it keeps growing. And thanks for tuning in to uh, Chief Pigskin TV. We're back from commercial break, and you just listened to William Fly talk about his progressions for the four major lifts. Now, Coach, when you told me your topic, I thought, I don't really understand what he's talking about. And I think my brain was first thinking in terms of, like, sets and reps. And then you got to that first one, and you opened it up, and you started talking about squat progression. You're like, first we're going to air squat, and I'm like, Oh, progressions. And then I was like, yes, this is what we need to be doing. And so, so anyway, I love these things. I love these progressions and a couple things in there that I hadn't thought of doing. So let me just go to the top of my questions and I'll just go from there and we'll see where the conversation goes. Um, you know what? I'm going to come back to this question, but I do not want to forget to come back to that question. Do you have the progressions post it anywhere so that the kids know like okay there's five steps to be able to actually squat i'm on step two um we don't have the progressions per se uh we use a block system um if you are prefer familiar with joe kian um, i just heard that name uh at the, on the last show with jack russman yes and so joe kian well if you're a carolina person you may know who Joe Ken is because he used to be the strength coach at the Carolina Panthers for for quite a while. Okay. Now he serves as the director of education for um, dynamic fitness and strength. And so he has an entire system on block zero. So preparing kids for athletic development. And another coach who's kind of taken that and just went off with it is a guy named uh, Coach Eric Cash. He's at Dorman High School in Roebuck, South Carolina. He actually wrote his doctorate on block zero, his dissertation on block zero. And so, no, it's just the block zero method is just taking what you do or what you want to do and breaking it down into its simplest components. And then I think my time as an elementary school PE teacher helped me for that. I had to teach kids how to skip, run, hop. It's like, God, first off, these little kids don't know how to tie their shoe. How do you teach them how to tie their shoe? Do you have to even break that down? Um, so we have our blocks posted. So our block zero movements, our block ones, our block twos, and our block threes. And our kids know where they are classified based upon the blocks. So our, at least our block zero, block zero will be the air squat the um, hand release push-up, the uh, high block, dumbbell deadlift, and then the RDO shrug or the jump shrug. And we'll progress them as such from there to where they'll know, hey, I have, I'm a fall sport athlete, I'm block zero, or I'm a winter sport athlete, I'm block two. So that's how they understand our progressions in that manner. Okay, so you had said, you know, like the – he's going to be on the air squat for a while. He's going to be a goblet squat for a while. Are any of these phases something that a kid could actually get through one within a week, within a day? Maybe he could get through – he could pass two of these in one day? Like, yeah. how long is a while in your book? Yeah, I could definitely um, – if the kid walks in and he's a transfer from school such and such, we talked about it before, we put, we put their progression and their, what they want to do in their hands. So if they show me and they knock out an air squat, they have good ankle mobility, hip mobility. I'm not really going to keep them on an air squat probably more than a week. And we'll roll them on into a goblet squat. Um, and honestly, with our goblet squat, I mean, if we're doing our one by 20 protocol, to which, you know, we'll do the same movements 
for every time they see me. And so let's say they do, you show up and you start off with a 50 pound dumbbell for goblet squat. You do that for 20. Next time you see me, you'll go on to 55 and 60, 65, 70, until either A, you do all the dumbbells or until I run out. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we'll progress through that. But if the dude's just, I mean, he's just a stud and I know it, then we probably won't keep him on there for that long. But if it's a kid that I don't have any idea about, like I don't know what school they came from. Yeah, let's say freshman. Let's say freshman. They're going to. They freshman? Yeah, we're going to keep, keep them. For how long? We're going to keep them there for a while. Like uh, the freshman um, will air squat only for a week? Uh, most freshmen, regardless if they're like a freak town or not, they will probably, do, well, at least we're in a normal situation where I get them in the summer. Right, right. Probably air squat. If we start in June, we'll probably air squat until 4th of July. Oh, my gosh. This is awesome, man. You're really a stickler about this. And then after 4th of July, we'll probably have them goblet squat. Because, I mean, I mean unless we're in a dire situation, those freshmen, they're going to play JV maybe. They might play a handful of games. <clears throat> and so we really just want to develop them appropriately so that when it is time for them to shine, that they are properly athletic developed. I don't want to rush and put a bar on a kid's back. And this kid's, what, what freshmen are 13 years old? And then their first experience squatting is they get crushed. And then that kid's not going to want to ever work out again. Yep. And so we just want to, you know, build positive experiences and you know, stack wins. So that way they enjoy training. I love it. Class, now, we enjoy training all the time. Let's that. say you get, now, because I had a real big boy once upon a time. I mean, shoot, I've always had, you know, over the years, had several real big boys come through that were pretty awkward as freshmen, really struggled. Um, and, and this was before I really knew much. I just had, for me, I told them they have to master squatting with the bar only, um, back squat, before we could put on weight. And I had one kid who was huge, uh, who was dying to do weight. And he, he didn't get to put on weight, weight for that entire first year. Um, and then he just, once he got it now, right, he just took off. Um, so when you look at that, do you get any kids, like, when is the longest, I guess, how long would you actually keep a kid off of a back squat? Is it, that, could it go years for you? I mean, if a kid's really just behind athletically, at least in the, I've had kids like that, you know, they, let's say they were at one height and you just, you know how it is. You know, they'll show up one, you know, in end of the school year at this. And let's say for whatever reason, you don't see him until August. And all of a sudden, that kid, he shot up. Or just a kid that he's just been big all his life. They've never been asked to move in a certain way. But it, we probably will keep kids. I've had a kid, he, he, he wasn't allowed to back squat for a year. Yeah. He only worked his way up to a front squat. Mm -hmm. Um, but at least when like for the back squat, I mean, that bar is resting on their back. The kid's initial reaction, when they're putting weight on their back, even with boot, you see them with boot bags, put boot bags on their backs, it's yeah, forward. And so they put that bar on their back. The first thing they're going to do is start leaning forward. So by doing a goblet squat, or if they're even ready for a front squat, it teaches them to brace here. And so that way they can stay vertical. So when it is time to move the bar to the back, they already know how to support their stomach and all the weight that they do carry. Okay. Now we're running a little long here. So I'm going to up my questions, at least skip ahead to some. On your power clean, how low do you, in I, how low ideally would they be catching the bar? In a full front squat? Um, and how, how much of a stickler are you on them catching? Love? When we teach it, I ask them to just drop themselves under the bar, however they got to go to receive it. Okay. Um, there are some times where hey, I want you catching it at a certain height to where we will, in, in our, in our cards and through our team builder stuff, we'll actually tell them, Hey, you're catching the bar at height position. Um, but honestly, I'm not going to really be picking, 
too picky on that. I'm not really, I'm not training Olympic lifters. I'm just training athletes. And I do have some kids that they, they're comfortable going butt to grass, butt to concrete, and going to catch that thing all the way down there and standing up. So that's what I want to do. By all means, they can do that. Um, but, yeah, I'm not going to be too picky about how they receive the bar. Okay. Okay. I like, I'm glad I heard that. Tell me, what is the difference between in the power clean? Am I training something different when an athlete cleans from the floor than I am when he cleans from the knees? Um, from the knees, it is, at least to me, it is just overall explosion. So from, from the hip up. Mm -hmm. From the floor, you obviously are generating all that time and space from the floor. So essentially, a power clean, if you want to break it down, it is a deadlift, at least from the shin to the knee, and then from the knee, it turns into a hand clean. Mm -hmm. Obviously, kids are going to be able to power clean more than they can hand clean. Um, but it, I mean, to me, it's just a progression. The end goal was for us to power clean. But no, we, we, there would be some times to where, hey, we're not cleaning, we're not doing it from the floor for our next training phase. Everything is from the knee. Okay. We can work on that um, fast explosion. Or we'll just do it from the hip or just vary those points we talked about just to work um, different angles in different um, positions. Okay, last question. Do you do anything or do you catch the kids as they start getting heavier that they, get, they can start getting sloppy with their feet? Like they're catching with them way too wide. How yeah. do you battle that and how strict are you on that? Um, I'm very strict on the – whole starfish catch thing because you know, I've just I've seen it in person at least in my you know, younger times but maybe even when I was in college we didn't have a division three most places don't have a strength coach but I've seen kids just tear everything in that knee and they're done mm -hmm. so I'm very stickler on their feet I will actually get chalk and we'll draw lines on the floor and to where I'll start, I'll have, I'll actually just put it on the bottom of their shoes to where when they go from the jump to the squat, their obviously feet are going to hit the floor and leave an imprint on the floor. Mm -hmm. Instead of, hey, this is where you started, this is where you finish. Um, some schools, they use a cross. It's, uh, I, I can't remember the exact name of it, but that's it. It's just a way so the kids know how far their feet should be. And essentially, if at least in a football standpoint, if your feet are way out like that, you're going to lose. And so we want everything to translate to the grass, to the yes. court, to the track. There's nothing athletically that happens out here. All right, Coach. One second. I, I've got. I'll have to do this one more thing, and then I'm going to ask my last question. Okay. Okay, I wanted to hear that because, again, I kept fighting it. Now, did, were there any tools, though, to help coach the feet? Now, you did say the chalk. I've yeah. seen somebody um, had the kids clean inside a hula hoop once upon a yeah, time. Yeah. How do you feel they about would, that? Um, as long as they don't trip over the hula hoop. I mean, <laughs> okay, right, right. Or you can easily just change it to where you can just uh, draw a circle on the floor. Yeah. Um, just draw boxes in the floor, or you can just put um, tape on the floor. So yeah. roughly, this is your position when you jump, and roughly, this is your position when you catch. And so, I mean, those are just easy ways. I think the tape would be probably cheaper than hula hoops. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. You would be, and your feelings when the hula hoop breaks, rather than if the uh, tape breaks, <laughs> <laughs> tape down. And that's the truth. Well, Coach, uh, I really appreciate this, man. These notes are going to be put to use. Um, I'm excited about this. I get really excited when the freshmen come in. I want to teach them. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm kind of mean in that I enjoy telling the kid, whoa, 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 whoa. We got a lot to learn before you start throwing on this weight, right? Those mm -hmm. freshmen come in the weight room and they're ready to – they're ready to pick it all up. And I'm like, yeah. whoa, whoa, baby, we ain't ready for that. So um, I got a huge kick out of this, Coach. These things are going to be put to use. If you guys want to reach out to Coach Fly, look him up on Twitter. It was at Coach Fly. 
At fly coach underscore six A. At fly yeah. coach. Underscore. I'm the only coach fly that I know of. Uh, the only fly coach I know of, anyway. Um, yeah. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, anything again, anything you need, I'll be more than happy to help you out. Well, look him up, guys. Coach, appreciate your time. Thanks for being on the Power Hour. And look us up if you ever need anything. Awesome. Thank you. Y'all have a good night.